Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. I'm here with Patreon supporter Mitchell Help. This is our monthly uh, conversation, I guess we could call it. Mitchell, how are you? I'm doing great. Um, so, well, first, how was your Thanksgiving? Uh, I'm fine. My, my children all were here. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, okay, what did you want to talk about today? Well, we, last time I, we spoke a little bit about uh, United States climate refugees, uh, East Coast, what are, where are they going to go? Well, we still don't know how bad and how fast it's going to be. But one of the issues we have is the encroaching uh, area where we are losing to agriculture because of lack of water in, in the Western states. And uh, within 10 to 12 years, we might be talking all the way to a line between uh, Minneapolis and Oklahoma City, uh, west of that, uh, really going to be difficult for agriculture. And uh, so? of course, uh, the amount of water available to Iowa is is starting to get impinged. And currently, just west of the Missouri River on the west side of Iowa, it's uh, getting difficult to use uh, uh, irrigation. And in northwest Iowa, uh, aquifers are drying up. There used to be so much water in the aquifers that we had what we called flowing wells or artesian wells, mm -hmm. where if you stuck a pipe in the ground and, and punctured about 12 feet down, uh, water would start shooting up. No pump necessary. Uh, and uh, that water is gone. Oh. Uh, just just in, in my short lifetime, that water is gone. Um, the area became used for making alcohol. And it takes a lot of water to make alcohol. And they piped those uh, um, flowing wells and just ran them dry. Well, that was also what kept the area so moist that they could grow massive amounts of soybean and corn. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's done. Uh, and and I'm not talking just feedlots. I'm talking about food for people. <laughs> and really feeding people uh, vegetables isn't that different than feeding animals vegetables. Right. So uh, uh, one of the things out here, it is not popular yet, but in, in any type of uh, production, manufacturing, food, whatever, when you make things in large batches in a short period of time and then idle, it's a really low efficiency use of, of your equipment. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a car make all of their cars in two weeks for an entire year and then go idle because you'd have to have this huge facility, huge distribution system, and uh, then most of the time it'd be idle. And so it's money that's tied up. Uh, people use it slowly over the year. So cars build a few cars every day. Well, a few hundred, few thousand, but, it, but they have a constant supply. Every day they're making cars. Right. But in our agriculture system, the way we're currently set up, we produce a whole bunch of corn and soybeans and we uh, harvest it with all, all within a month. So we have these huge piles of corn here, huge piles in, of wheat in, in Kansas, huge piles of beets in the Dakotas. Uh, and it's an, animals get on them and do things on them that we, people don't really like to think about when they're at the store. <laughs> uh, you know, you get lettuce, you get great big piles of lettuce, you, suddenly all of the romaine lettuce is on recall for E. coli because it's exposed to the animals. It, it's just difficult to control when we grow all of our food in batches. Right. And there's this company, and I, I'm, I'm not paid by this company at all, uh, and uh, uh, I, I pull the system up here, and I'm going to share once I do the movement over here. Oops, wants me to move the whole thing. Okay, uh, that uh, uh, soybeans, a, a lot of vegan food made out of soybean. Mm -hmm. Currently in Iowa, we grow one crop per year of soybean. So, uh, and here comes the share. Uh, again, I am sharing uh, an actual different company's website. Okay. I don't think they would mind me showing. You should be seeing some green, green things on, on, on shelves. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see it on your screen now. Uh, this is a fodder system. We almost can eat, uh, growing wheat is not that different from growing uh, grasses, okay. wheat, wheat to grass. So by expanding this another 
eight, 18 or, or so inches high per shelf, they can grow wheat, they can grow soybeans, they can grow beets. <laughs> The, the foods that we are losing the ability to grow in the next 15 to 20 years, they can grow. But not only that, for the given area, we can grow seven times as much. Uh, and we can grow it at a reduced cost. There's a lot of labor involved, a lot of injuries involved in, in farming currently. Because it's not done like in other industries we had where we had OSHA saying, OSHA is not allowed on a farm. Well, OSHA would be law, uh, mandatory in a situation like this. So, uh, what typically costs? Uh, on this website, if I could read it real quick, only one man hour of labor per ton keeps the cost low. Yes, so this that, is, because because you're saying because this is hydroponic fodder systems and greenhouses. This isn't spread out over all this land where you need all this labor to cover it because it's all on top of each other, basically. Yes, not only that. But remember, I talked about you don't uh, cars. You don't build them all in one day of the week right. or one day of the year. This and out here, I, I should have done it. I have there, there's there's uh, hay bales for feeding cattle and pigs. Uh, well, no cattle. The hay bales would only be for cattle. Uh, all around out here, and you know, we'll see a mile by a mile of of, of these bales laid laid out, and they're huge. They take a, a a tractor to lift them up, and one bale for uh, 16 cattle might last a month. So they have thousands of these bales of hay that take all of the space to, to grow because it has to be grown. Uh, I think they get three crops of hay per year. Is It's in the summer months. They need like uh, like eight or 10, 10, maybe eight weeks to grow a thing of, of, of uh, hay. So they get several and they have to store them in, in great big bags or plastic bags. The bags get thrown in the landfill. Uh, and it's a whole lot of waste. It's a whole lot of labor. It's a whole lot of danger because people get injured mm -hmm. on, on these systems. So here we have a system that says, okay, what if we didn't have to make it all in one day? So I, uh, there are systems like this now that uh, in sale in this area where people grow instead of a whole farm field, they have a, a, a little barn growing what they need day to day. <laughs> So every day they go out and they get fresh uh, stuff and they give it to their livestock. So it's more, I, I realize as a vegan, it's horrifying to you, but at least they get good food. They get to enjoy some, some really fresh greens and whatever, but microgreens for people can be grown the same way. So we could do this basically in a city. I mean, we could do this in, a, in any massive city. We could put this in a warehouse, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and so this this can be why, uh, and the the closer so uh, areas like California, where your for farm fields now are going to be at risk of burning away, right. uh, you can uh, control uh, your your area so you're not at a fire risk having extra things. So out here, we actually have to have our soybean in the field for a month to a month and a half after it's done growing to dry so that it doesn't grow mold while it's stored in this great big pile. I, I, next month, I'm going to have to get some pictures and actually show mm -hmm. what the piles of soybeans look like here after harvest. But, but uh, I, again, when you don't have this surge and you have this constant supply, uh, the price goes down because you don't need these enormous structures of distribution anymore. Oh. And, and, and you have fresher food. Fresher food is better food. Uh, when, when you give the animals, which could be people, because let's substitute this for wheat or rice, uh, we have uh, people getting the fresher. And a lot of the nutrients go away during the dry, drying cycle. As the stuff gets older, it, gets, uh, uh, it degrades. So instead of having your food be uh, weeks or months old, because uh, currently in the wintertime, when we run out of stocks, then we're starting to use uh, uh, food that has been grown in other countries. Right. So the shipping here, it's a long time. To When you talk about getting a tomato up in the Midwest, you have this long shipping time. Well, we get away with that. There's something else you get away from. Bugs. Let's say we don't need pesticides to grow this way. Oh. Or you need an extremely reduced amount of, of, of pesticides. 
So, um, uh, I mean, like in, in my system, I, I use the equivalent of soap. So you have a hydroponic system where you live. That's what the pinkness, pinkness is behind me. Can we show me the photo? Bring it back to your screen. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me uh, let me clear the stop. I, I behind that wall there is there's some pink bleeding through. Okay. And right now it's just coffee. Can you minimize your screen? Oh, um, minimize. There you go. I got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you're growing coffee right behind you right now. Yeah. Coffee. And uh, I set out the watermelons yesterday. So watermelons are getting ready to go, and I've got onions ready to go. Uh, the onions take a year to grow. Really? Yes. Now, well, if I get a little bit sidetracked just for a second, labor in preparing food. A lot of the time of preparing an onion is peeling. Get that paper, right. <laughs> chopping it. Now, what if that onion, instead of being like this big, was this big? So you're peeling one, so I, I can grow one onion a week. So I start one this week, I start one next week, and I start one next week. And each onion is 15 pounds. So I can grow 12 foot or 12 inch diameter onion rings. <laughs> <laughs> so if I give somebody an onion ring, hey, would you like an onion ring? You give them one. <laughs> it's the equivalent of a whole easier to cook, less labor, right? Uh, and, and, you know, everything gets simpler when you think about how am I going to do this? And instead of having onions grow and de degrading, drying up, molding, <laughs> and, you know, the state of the onions you see at a store. Imagine you pick it fresh, right? <laughs> Still fresh, hundred percent ready to go. You cry a little bit just because you not be, just because you killed the onion, right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know when, when we were doing this in, in the kitchen in the first first system we had, uh, we were growing mini peppers. They're they're about so long and, and kind of teardrop shaped, and every day when I made a stir fry, I could go out. Seconds before I cooked, chopped a whole bunch of preppers right when they're at their prime. They didn't have to be picked early. Like a lot of people have this bad idea of greenhouse food because they think it, it doesn't have the taste. Well, it doesn't have the taste because it's picked and shipped weeks early. <laughs> and it's, it's not on a living vine when it's still being shipped out. Right. But if when we were doing uh, onions or uh, tomatoes and peppers in the house, I, I had a, an eight foot wide, eight foot tall, two foot deep uh, tomato plant we called, uh, um, oh, I forgot already. <laughs> um, we, we named it something from the Little Shop of Horrors. But, uh, <laughs> oh, Seymour. And after two years, we had to give it to my aunt because it just was getting too big to have in the house anymore. And we took it down, put it in a, uh, a convertible and took, took it up. So how, how easy is this to set up in anyone for anyone to set this up in their home? I'm getting it pretty easy. Uh, and uh, um, currently uh, the, the lights are just two colors and I'm changing them to three colors. Okay. I, I currently use blue and, and, and red, but I'm going to go to blue, white, and red because uh, uh, sometimes it's easier to see. The strangest thing about red is I can turn the blue off uh, and uh, ripe peppers glow. And then how uh, much the cook? Because I was just looking at, so the website you just had up, is the cost of that was like, it said fourteen or $15,000. That seemed like a pretty big industrial size system. What would it cost for somebody to just do this in their own home, roughly, to get a moderate setup? I'm thinking to, to get a moderate one. Uh, uh, right now, I'm I'm doing... A shift from 18 to 36 plants of peppers, uh, and then uh, I'll be going with buckets for the uh, onions. Um, so it's it's how much space you want to give up. There's two layers behind me. The top layer has room for uh, 12 buckets of onions, and uh, like I said, the uh, at least 36 uh, layers or pots of 
of mini peppers. Uh, and uh, below there, I'm going to start doing a head of lettuce. So if you do a head of lettuce, and a lettuce takes takes 10 weeks, well, if but you- your whole setup, what did it cost you, do you think, roughly? Uh, well, because I, I did it myself a few hundred. Really? <laughs> yeah. And if you wanted to hire one of these companies, it might be, what, a couple of grand, maybe? Probably a few grand, yeah. Uh, and it, it's basically PVC. You don't need the, the wall on it. Originally, um, the it was a, a bonus. I, I needed the wall, which is just uh, plywood on a PVC frame. And then the PV frame's two feet deep, so I've got the grower, grower area on now, that. Do these hydroponic systems, especially the, the larger industrial size ones that we, we just looked at earlier, do they then use less water? Yes, it uh, takes about 10% less water to grow um, most most food human food crops uh, hydroponically than it does uh, in, in ground. Really? Yeah, well, think about it. When you're, when you're growing outside, uh, plants breathe through a process called transpiration, respiration, respiration. Wow. Anyway, little molecules of water as they're going up, heat up. And as they're sucked out the top of, of the plant, well, actually the bottom of the leaves, the stoma, as they're being sucked up, they draw water up with them. So when they give the water to the atmosphere, that's how they draw more water up. Well, giving it to the atmosphere is the clue. You lose it. When you're in an enclosure, uh, it's also called con con controlled environment agriculture. When you're in an environment, you recapture your moisture. So the only moisture you lose is the moisture you send out in your product. Oh. So if a, if a plant is 95% uh, water and you sell a pound, well, 95% of the pound is, of water is what you have to replace. The rest of the plant you grind up and, and reuse for for future use <laughs> or or sell it for other pro pro processes well, that's uh, fascinating so so how do you uh, how do you see this system on a mass scale or what what could we i mean uh, how, what am i trying to say here uh, like how do we get these systems in place on a mass scale? Should we just all just put them into our own homes or, or is it something that is better suited to set up private companies to do? I mean, like what is the best way do you think to do this as we, as we start talking about, I mean, you and I have had several conversations about what the next 20 years are gonna look like in this country in terms of how the climate change is affecting it. And, yeah, there's efficiency and scale. Right. So, um, the, the more we cluster together, uh, well, the better we have a, a system going. That, that is our best bet. Uh, so there's no reason you couldn't have some, like I said, you know, standard size closet. You can have a perpetual supply of lettuce for a family of three or four. You know, how much lettuce do you use in a week? One head, two heads? Do you use a head a week? All you need is 36 pots in, in each each week, or not, not 36, but 10 pots. And each week you harvest one. <laughs> and at the end, you got the other one empty, start growing another one. Your first four weeks, all you need is a little cup with the seedling in it. So you could literally set up a warehouse. Like you could go, let's say, just any city that's got some sort of warehouse district. There's an abandoned warehouse or something in a neighborhood that's not great. You could A company could buy this set up hydroponic uh, growing and uh, have a, a, a organic, you know, a store attached to it and sell the produce to the people in the neighborhood. Yeah. And, and I, I, I drive by this as a, in a small town in Iowa and I'm looking at it thinking like, this is the next Bill Gates. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, nobody's going to catch up with them in the time and advances of what they've got or it's going to be difficult for somebody to get as far along as they have, have decent systems out there that are in use. So, you know, if I were to compare this to Bill Gates's rise, he's already at the, I've already sold it to IBM stage. And, uh, uh, you know, I wish I did this first, but he's, he's ahead of me. Uh, but again, my own uses, you know, head of lettuce is expensive. Right. Uh, so, if I grow 50 heads a year, I've saved myself $50. Right. And uh, 
the nutrient pump system is basically an air pump in a bubble. And sometime I'll, uh, I need to take a picture of that and, and show it. Uh, a nutrient. There are three types of nutrient. You have the type of the flood, uh, flood a tray, which is like what these are. <clears throat> you have the type where you spray fluid down on them. And you have the type that uh, um, uh, basically are buckets that have the fluid in it and your, your plant grow, floats on top. <clears throat> you put a piece of styrofoam with a hole in it, you put your plant on top of it and just constantly stays with water. And you bubble air into it to keep it going. A variant of the type that's a tray is, is what I, I do is I take a bubble and I use the bubble to lift the nutrient up above and then it drips down on my plants. So is this something we could, anyone, an individual could invest in? Yeah. I mean, you could go buy stock in that company now or you could make your own. <laughs> uh, I was, I've been conferring with somebody for years on, on trying to get a book done to, to uh, how to do this one. Oh, cause uh, this is something that somebody with a, a, a saw, a pair of scissors and uh, just a bit of electronics could actually finish. All right. Uh, well, this is, I mean, this is fantastic. And, and um, give me uh, you know, email me the link to that website we just looked at so I can put it in the show notes here for everybody watching. Um, okay. So they and like I said, that is a professional system doing it. <laughs> that is not, that is not some, something made up in the news. Yeah. This is version three. This guy's been doing it for a while and it looks good. I even talked to uh, a, a rancher about it because uh, like I said, this, this doing it every day, not having to go out and shop. Uh, some ranchers out West, you know, they got snow problems where they have to beg the government to come out and drop bales of hay to their, to their livestock. Right. No, not in this. You say, Hey, livestock, stay here by the nice building. <laughs> and, and some people actually treat their livestock well. That's uh, fantastic. You know. I mean, and also, so then that web, so the, that company, the website that you're going to give me the link for that everyone, that's a company you could then go on and buy stock in if you wanted to. Yeah. Farm tech. All right. Yeah. It is, it is not a small company. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they're already <laughs> up there. They are, they are a farm supply company that has branched out. And uh, um, so uh, taking care of their customers uh, looks like a really responsible company so far. Uh, and, and like I said, all of it can be used. All this technology can be used just to feed human directly, even if you just eat vegetables. Well, the thing that's so amazing about this is, is, is not only does it have amazing uses today and, and when, you know, these climate catastrophes and refugees happen, that also, when it, you know, there's a huge issue in this country, I don't know if people realize it, of especially in the inner cities, of people in the inner cities getting access to fresh fruits and vegetables and, and organic produce because there's no Whole Foods or Trader Joe's in the inner city. And I see it just in, in, when I go into South Central. Um, I don't, there's no, there's no co-ops there. There's no Trader Joe's. There's no Whole Food. There's none of that. There's no health food stores. There's none of that. And I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna reach over and grab something. It, 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 this is the kind of thing that like, if I had the money, I would start putting these in neighborhoods that don't have access to it. And I would, I would set one of these places up and I would employ everybody in the neighborhood and I'd attach a grocery store next to it if somebody doesn't have access to a store the, the very simplest growing at home that, uh, that i would recommend because if you buy sprouts at the store they have a high uh, reputation for uh, with, uh, toxins like uh, e coli and whatever uh, so afterwards these haven't been cleaned yet so if I'm going to make a stir fry on Friday, I just have to think four days ahead instead of going down to the store and, and buying it. Um, uh, mung beans, uh, they're really good nutrition. And uh, so a mung, be a mung bean sprout <coughs> it takes four days to go, does not require light. So you can grow one to get all your seeds, grow it in the light and the rest of them you, you put in a little container like this. Um, you, you 
you you fill I, again this this one needs to be sterilized before I, I run it again but uh, basically uh, you, you take uh, two tablespoons of, of mung bean seeds or um, you can even do other seeds like broccoli seeds uh, oh, I have some here. like your nuts.com uh, just you just actually pour a bunch in there shake it up pour a couple cups of water in it put the cap on uh, and you stick this in your closet a closet that doesn't got any light on so you don't want the louvre kind you want the kind that's dark uh, and you leave this in there every night you, you you take the water that's gone to the bottom throw it out and you put another couple of cups in the top <laughs> you put it back together and you stick it in the closet four days later you have a really good mung bean not a mung bean that's been sitting in a can for six months not a mung bean that's been grown in the sand and harvested in some country where you wouldn't even visit for sanitation reasons but you have a, a sanitary mung bean made in your house with all kinds of nutrients <laughs> that's taken carbon dioxide out of the air of your house and turned it into food. So Simplest that's, way. That's amazing to me and that's something. And, and as a vegan, this is one of the foods you're supposed to be eating. <laughs> it's that easy, that easy. Uh, and uh, uh, a friend of mine is a uh, um, plant physiologist and a biology professor. And he's, he's like, uh, vegans. Make sure when you know vegans, you gotta tell them there's 26 foods they gotta eat. Sorry, I forgot them all. <laughs> I just know that this was one of them. All right. Uh, and my my wife, uh, where I were trying to be more toward the vegetarian side than than total carnivores, and this was one of the things we did. Uh, and also, uh, a, a can of of mung beans out here because you know mung beans really don't grow in Iowa. People don't. <laughs> People don't grow mung bean spots in Iowa. So $1.89, $2 a can out here for a 15-ounce can, that's ridiculous. Especially if you got a family of four and you're trying to feed everybody and you need two or three cans. Well, that's a lot of money per meal. Right. But uh, one bag of mung, mung beans. <clears throat> in fact, I've gone to Farmer's Co-op and I've gotten, oh, like five pounds of mung beans for a buck. <laughs> that's great. And you only need two tablespoons at a time. Is it? Well, so uh, so uh, there are all kinds of ways that you can really live well uh, with decent food grown in your house. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, uh, sorry, I got sidetracked. <laughs> no, that's fascinating, though, Mitch. I really, again, it's uh, these conversations you and I have every month. They're really informative, and this is a great way. You know, we talk a lot about on this show of. You know, I say vote with your dollars a lot on this show, and I talk about there's all these little things we can do to affect change. Well, growing your own food and support and is just affecting change of your own personal health and your own personal finances for starters, but then you're also not supporting the Monsantos of the world and all of the evil shit that they're doing. And, yeah. and we're all learning about something that like hydroponics, you literally could do this anywhere. If there's anybody watching who lives out in the sticks and it doesn't, you know, has long winters and stuff like that, you could use this. If you live in an inner city, you could use this. I mean, like there's, this is, this could, this could end world hunger. Like it's fascinating. Th th this is, a, this is, a, this is amazing. So. Well, the first thing people ask me if they want to grow a pot <laughs> and I go, no, you know, in, in three years, everybody's going to be growing pot. It's going to be worth a penny a pound. Right. <laughs> Beans, <laughs> coffee. Uh, the the the, the uh, coffee plant back there. I call it Arthur. It's an Arabica plant. So, coffee is uh, plants are are being climate challenged. We might lose coffee in Hawaii and in in Colombia. Uh, so, if we lose those sources of coffee, we we're going to be uh, to the point where coffee beans are going to be what ma marijuana was five years ago. Yeah, coffee beans. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm looking at coffee bean, uh, black pepper. Black pepper is going extinct. Uh, there's a whole lot of food that tastes hor horrible without 
black pepper. One of the spices a, a, a chef will consider a staple is black pepper. So uh, Piper Negrum, the, the plant that grows black pepper, I've been playing with that. And it's touchier than, than uh, coffee. I'm finding coffee takes about anything I throw at it. And uh, uh, so uh, the uh, watermelons, yeah, you can grow watermelons in your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just pick them up and, and you keep stacking them in, around and you have to put little nets to hold them up. They're, they're very fragile. Yeah. You have to hold them up gently, take their weight off so they're not in there. So you can grow a few, <laughs> a few watermelons in a, in a, in a small area. Uh, and like I said, uh, my biggest challenge is the onions because the onions are so large. Right. Well, I mean, Mitchell, this is fantastic, man. Thanks again. You always enlighten us with such great not stuff I had no idea of. And uh, for everybody watching, go check out that uh, link to the website that's in the show notes below. And of course, this is one of the things you get to do at the $25 level on the Patreon, which is a great way to support the show. You know, they're, they're, um, YouTube is making it hard to make money. So any way that anyone can support the show, if you go to Patreon, that helps. And then like and share these videos out. That's a great way to support the show. So, uh, Mitchell, thank you so much for your time, man. And again, all the time and energy and research and your own little lab back there that we can see is pretty, <laughs> is pretty fantastic. So if I ever come to Iowa, I'm excited to eat some of your fresh grown mung beans and watermelon. Okay. Well, the watermelons are probably three months out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll probably be about the time I, I roll through Iowa. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, uh, sorry I got sidetracked. I don't think we re re even ended up talking about what I was. <laughs> it's all right, but this was very informative. So, uh, but I think this is the only way. If, if Iowa is to take on ten million people from the East Coast, this is the only way we're going to be able to feed. Them. Right, right. Uh, well, I think uh, that's how I started it. <laughs> thanks for for all your help and your information and supporting the show, and thank you to everybody out there for watching and for making Gotham great again. <laughs>